Dr. John Wilson, who is Dean Emeritus and Professor Emeritus at Pepperdine, who is donating a wonderful collection of books on uh, travel and exploration of sites in the Middle East. And today he has brought his first installment of those books. They're up in our archive right now. And it's a beautiful collection. It's a unique collection, but it's also a very beneficial and useful collection. And we're very, very excited. And from the library, we just want to say thank you so very much. He actually physically wrote it. And I want to thank you on behalf of the school here. Uh, you're a 1961 graduate, I think, of Harding School, Harding Graduate School of Religion. And uh, this is a special day. There's a sense in which uh, you entrust us with something that's very valuable to you. And uh, we take that very seriously. And it's also a time where uh, all of us can just uh, get to know John Wilson better and, and hear you talk and reflect and so, uh, Welcome, glad you're here. Thank you. We have coffee. Really we special have event this afternoon. It's something that uh, I have been excited about, kind of like a kid in a candy store. Uh, when he first took me up to his bedroom, and across from his bed are six bookcases, <laughs> or more, I guess about six. And he said, you gotta see this, and you gotta see this. And he's got a pretty good restoration collection, but when he got into the Bible lands and all of that, it was like, I don't think anything like that exists anywhere. And uh, I got quite excited about that and tried to convince him. Anytime he's gone, let me come house sit. You know, I'd be glad to kind of <laughs> protect those books as, and, you know, work through them. But Dr. John Wilson uh, went from Springfield, um, Missouri, where he was living, along with some of the, the, uh, yeah, what was your, Maiden name? Cobb. Yeah, with the Cobb girls, that's what it was, with the Cobbs. And uh, went to Harding College, graduated, went home to be the youth minister, where the preacher was L.O. Sanderson. So there's a great connection there. And then he got involved in campus ministry and found out the University of Missouri would let him teach courses for credit if he had at least a master's degree. So that motivated him to come back spent a year here working on his master's degree and knocked that off at record time. <laughs> Went back and started teaching. Then when they started a, a um, department of religion, he also figured out that if he had a, a doctor's degree that um, he'd be, he would be able to teach there. I think I got that right. And then, so as a result of that, he went to the University of Iowa and one of his uh, colleagues there was Harold Hayslip. I think they studied together every day. Um, smarts ran off, you know, rubbed off on both sides, I guess. That's how that worked. And, uh, and then went back and was actually on faculty of the University of Southern Missouri or so. What they call it Missouri State. Missouri University State, now. right. Missouri State University. Was there for a number of years and then was hired at Pepperdine as a dean and served there for 20 years. <coughs> and when I was hired at Pepperdine, he was my dean. So, uh, and when it, when we, had this discussion, and I didn't know the connection between him and Hazlip at the time, but Hazlip was going to move, Dr. Hazlip was moving to Lipscomb to become president. And so I talked to John and I said, you know, I've talked to Dr. Hazlip, Dr. Slade, they'd like me to come back here. And <laughs> I think he was a little bit like, mm, okay, but he was really gracious and encouraged me, I think, to come here, which I have always really appreciated and respected. Then it got better. Every year I'm in Israel, I get to see him just about when I go in the June period, because for 10 years he excavated at Capernaum. And one of the days we were there with a group and connected with us, oh, you gotta, you gotta come see this, you gotta come see this. So he took me down and they actually found a Roman bathhouse on the other side of the wall of the Capernaum you typically see, because that's the Catholic side of the wall, they were excavating on the Greek Orthodox side of the wall and found a Roman bathhouse, which really fits well with the story of a Roman centurion in Capernaum, because you're always thinking, this is a Jewish village. How, how could that be? So that was exciting. He excavated with Basilius there for 10 years or so, and then 
started excavating 10 years at Caesarea Philippi. So also always enjoyed him taking us around. Didn't know if this was, you know, storage vaults or market in the main street, you know, this kind of thing at uh, Caesarea Philippi. So we've just really had a, I've just really admired and appreciate, appreciated Dr. Wilson. When he said, back in one of our visits at his house, and I think I'm, you think HST would be interested in these books? Absolutely. <laughs> so Bob got involved in this discussion, and Jessica's done a wonderful job continuing this discussion. And what he's brought today, he, he's on a, a month travel trip visiting friends. He's got family, daughters out this direction, and he wanted to personally deliver the oldest of the collection. There's going to be about five or six hundred books in this collection that are in chronological order, starting in 1701, of pilgrims to the Bible lands, so some Turkey, Greece, and Israel. That's, I mean, an incredible collection of pilgrims to archaeologists to Bible dictionaries that have people who've been there and, and sketched pictures of these places from the 18th century all the way up to the 20th century. The collection he brought today in about, I don't know, there's seven boxes or so, 150 books. These are the books from 1701 to 1863. And this is actually, if you want to look at the, we'll pass this around and you can look and see kind of the books that are uh, in this collection. In our collection here in the library, we have a book by Hode, Eugene Hode. If you've done much with Palestine, you'll recognize him as one of the early writers of the best guide to the Bible lands. Uh, it was Holy Land, I forget the title he had of it, but Pilgrims, uh, mainly to Israel. And in the back of it, he has a bibliography of everything he knew about in 1950 in English that goes back to at least the 10th century. And he, it's a bibliography of all of these. Well, one day when I got totally bored in my retirement, it's a joke, uh, I went through there, and it's interesting, four of the books that are in his collection are older than what he thought they were, and the what he found, and this is, of course, before the internet, you could really find some of these. I don't know how he came up with this collection. It's pretty incredible. Maybe a COVID leak. I don't, I don't know where they came up with it. He has 39 books that were not even on his list from that same period. And then, of course, he's got about 400 more books listed because he's only looking at pilgrims uh, in that part of the land. But if you want to look at this book, it's good because it it has this example of two of the stories of those pilgrims who went there. Okay, so that's the background. You think that's a pretty valuable collection? Uh, it it uh, to see the impact of archaeology, the impact of travel, and what you see today is nothing like what some would have seen in some of these stories. So, yeah, I guess it's either a hobby, a passion, or an addiction. <laughs> We're not sure. Part of us, he may have spent too much time with W.B. West, but whatever it was, he has spent a lot of time in bookstores in England, in Israel, in L.A., and in Southern California. There's been a lot of them. And that's how, over the years, he's been collecting just an incredible group of books. So we were going to ask him to share the story of two or three of these. Uh, I mean, these are really precious. I, certainly to him, but I think you might see why as he gives the background of some of these books. So, do you want to add something before you go to one of these books? And well, I just say that uh, uh, about the time that I started going to to dig in Israel, I began to realize that these sites uh, have a have a modern history in the sense that they just have been gradually rediscovered. And, uh, and almost everybody in the 19th century who went to the Holy Land wrote a book about it. And a lot of those books are totally lost, but a lot of them were around. And, and I, I think you could just go, this kind of book could just get thicker and thicker uh, because everybody did that. Well, it's wonderful because they see something that's no longer there. A lot of things have happened in the Middle East, obviously. 
through the years and people saw things in 1830 that are no longer there. Another thing I liked and I started collecting them, I wanted to put them in chronological order because I wanted to be able to say, I actually started this or, or, or used this when I was doing the book on Caesarea Philippi, I thought I'll just go through and see what somebody who went there in 1805 saw, what they, somebody who went in 1810 saw, in 1815 and 20, and I could just, uh, didn't have to go back to the, to the card catalog every time, it was just, that was the next book. And you could just stand there and go through and, and get the whole history of a site. And then the, the whole area, things were happening in the area, and you know, this was, everybody thought this was Turkey, and we often don't think to look at Turkish works. And, uh, all those I was uh, I was saying earlier, and I'll just give you a real brief account of this story. A good friend of mine, James Russell, was uh, at one time the president of the American Archaeological uh, Association. He's a Scotsman and had an old classical uh, education and uh, taught at the University of British Columbia for many years. And we used to room together on excavations, along with uh, Joseph Blinkensop. Some of you may know that name, the Old Testament scholar at Notre Dame. So the three of us were roommates. And uh, uh, Jim Russell came to visit me uh, uh, one time and I put him in this bedroom that had the shelves with, the, with this collection in it. <clears throat> and when he came down the next, now he's a classically trained classicist. Uh, he knew eight or ten languages intimately uh, and uh, had that old sort of education that people of his generation had. Amazing man with a thick Scotch brogue. And uh, I said, well, Jim, uh, how was your night? He said, awful. I said, well, you didn't sleep? He said, I didn't sleep a wink, not one minute all night long. I said, oh, well, that's terrible, that's awful. Was the bed not comfortable? What? He said, no, 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 I didn't get in the bed. He said, I just spent all night going from one book to the next book to the next book to the next book. And he said, I'd never had the opportunity to just do that in, in, in chronology, in chronological order like that. And he said, don't ever put me in that room again. So uh, anyway, uh, one other thing about just putting the collection together, this, it started about 50 or 60 years ago, actually. And I would just, anywhere I went, try to find out if there was an old bookstore there. Uh, these are not books that, uh, some of them are in beautiful, perfect condition. They probably came from some uh, Earl of something or another in some, his country manor library, and it's probably got his name in it somewhere. You'll see, you'll find books in the collection like that. But a lot of them have been, got into the market and went from bookstore to bookstore, and sometimes they get a little, uh, uh, fragile, but every book has its own story, not just what's in it, but where it's been. And uh, that became more and more interesting to me too, to see what I could find out about books, about the story of the book itself. And that's what, uh, can I talk about these? Or? Yes, go for okay. it, yes. I'll just mention this one interest, particularly interesting example. Um, there was a, a Naval Lieutenant, U.S. Naval Lieutenant named Lynch, who, uh, in I believe around the 1840s, was sent by the U.S. government to the Middle East, and he did, he did an exploration of the Dead Sea. And uh, so came back and put this together. It's called the Expedition to the Dead Sea and the Jordan. I'm sure there's already one in the library here. Uh, it's, a, it's a classic book uh, with Americans, very early in American history, uh, doing exploration there. Well, I've had, I have, there are two or three copies of this in the collection of different editions and so on. But as I was getting these things together to, to bring them, uh, I, I, I looked in the front and I saw something I'd never seen before in, the, in here. It says at the top, Lieutenant John Quincy Adams, 1849, U.S. Navy. Well, I knew this was not John Quincy Adams, President John Quincy Adams, because he was never in the, in the Navy. So I began to do a little bit of research and I discovered that this is in fact the grandson uh, of, of John Adams, uh, our uh, founding father. And uh, he, he, this is, he was a lieutenant in the US Navy and so was Lynch. 
I got the book in, a, in one of the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I'm sure the book never left Washington and probably was given by Lynch to his good friend, fellow lieutenant, John Quincy Adams, who is John Quincy Adams III. So this is, this is only a, a bit over a generation away from our fan, founding father, John Adams. And then, and then it says, C.H. Uh, Boyd from cousin Lizzie Adams. 1901. I leave it to some of you all to find out who cousin Lizzie Adams is. She's probably maybe the granddaughter of Lieutenant John Quincy Adams. I don't know. And then down, and then it has another person's name in 1919. So this book is obviously thought of as a valuable historical thing and being passed along from generation to generation. How it ever got out of the family's hands and into mine, I'm not sure, but somehow it uh, somehow it did. So sometimes it's, it's a wonderful book for what's the content, but it's also wonderful for its story. And there are quite a number of other books there like that. Uh, I was always on the lookout for that sort of thing. A lot of the, many, many of these, these books came, come from uh, Great Britain. I had the opportunity to live in Great Britain four or five times during my life and spent a lot of that time in bookstores. It's a, it's a wonderful place for book. W.B. West well, I was there one time and I got a call. This is W.B. West. I said, what are you doing, Dr. Will? I'm looking for books. So uh, we, we, uh, we could go in the same groove on that. But I went to countless little villages. I went to book fairs. Uh, I went to auctions of, uh, uh, of libraries, of country houses and that kind of thing. And a lot of these came from that sort of thing. Uh, uh, most of these books are in English. A lot, there are a number in French, but I did a similar thing in Paris and around Paris because, as you may know, for many years, a big chunk of the Middle East was under French protectorate. So a lot of the exploration and study and so on was done by the French, and sometimes the, uh, the books are only in French. There are a few in other languages. They're mostly uh, in English. And then it was amazing how things get sometimes get to the United States. Uh, it's amazing how they get to Burbank, California. And you think, what a strange place to find this particular book. So that's, uh, uh, that's where it came from. Let me just mention two other things. Besides uh, the fact that we get the stories of these explorers, I watched for women authors. It's amazing in the 19th century how many women, sometimes completely by themselves, just got on a boat and went to Cairo or somewhere and then got on a camel and just went all over the Middle East, sometimes unaccompanied and then came back and wrote books about it. And there are a number of books here like that. I also uh, looked for and, and got books by novelists who were using the Middle East as the background for their books. A number of, of very famous people wrote novels that are based, on, they're based on the Crusades or they're based on the fall of Jerusalem or they or uh, often they were stories uh, of, uh, Jewish people who converted to Christianity, and then and uh, these were used as evangelistic things uh, to show how this person went from uh, became a believer in Jesus. There was a lot of that kind of literature, so a lot of them had to do with the Middle East in sort of a little peripheral ways. But I felt like that gives you you know a broader understanding of the story, and of course uh, Voltaire wrote a book that's based there. I'm trying to think of the famous uh, British Prime Minister, uh, can't get a hold of his name now, but uh, but wrote a, a book based in the Middle East. Uh, he was a, actually a Jewish convert to Christianity. And does that help anybody know, anybody know British history well enough to know which British uh, Prime Minister was a, a convert from Judaism? Anyway, there are quite a number of books like that. So it's a, it's a little broader than just the travel thing. The other thing that I watched for, and I use this as an interesting example, this little book is, is a part of a set uh, that are back in the other room. It has a beautiful embossed leather cover, and it's just called Turkey. And uh, the particular, I just picked up one of them as an example. This is volume three. but. Uh, scattered throughout it, and by the way, I found this in a travel bookstore in London. Uh, they didn't have old, rare, leather-bound books. They had travel books. I don't know why they had this set. 
I guess it's the, they thought Turkey, that's some place you could travel to. So they, they had this, but I couldn't believe my good fortune because they're very rare. And one of the reasons they're very rare and desirable is all through these books are beautiful hand colored. I don't know how many of them are. They, they must number in the hundreds. These beautiful hand colored engravings uh, of the beautiful costumes that, uh, that were worn in the Middle East in the, particularly in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And uh, they're just wonderful. And you usually never find them in the book because years and years ago, people realized you can cut that out, put it in a frame and sell it for $200. And if there are 50 of them in this book, that's $200 of 50 times. You can see how the, it was very difficult to keep these books together. <coughs> as far as I know, none of them have, are gone from this uh, this one. There's one volume of the entire set that I don't think is is in the collection, but all the others are, and all the uh, these beautiful things. I was telling the the librarians here a little earlier. I was sad to find some years ago that almost all of these beautiful colored engravings from the 19th century were done by child labor. Children were taught how to use the paints and the brushes, and sat for hours every day. It's beautifully done work, uh, taking the engraving and giving it the color all by hand. So uh, think of the hundreds of copies that were made and somebody had to paint this elaborate, beautiful painting over and over and over again. And now we enjoy them today. There, there are a lot of books in the collection that had these color, hand colored uh, plates in them. What's the date on that one? This one is 1830. Let's see. I saw the date. Or it's it's in the early 1833. Yeah. Or, Do you mind if Jessica to keep a lot of hands from touching it? If she could just walk around and sure. show them one yeah, of pick, these. Pick out a nice. Yeah, Jessica, nice you pick out one and just walk around so they get a closer view of it. Since it the, would be so tempting if you had a book like right this there. to think. I'd love to have that framed and hanging in my living room. And that's what has happened so often to these books. I could not believe it when I went in this little drive bookstore, saw these and when I opened it and saw they're still there. The same thing is true with maps. I tried to always watch for volumes that still had the maps in them because they really disappear. People cut the maps out and, uh, and frame them. I think that one has a map in it. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, in fact, I always tried to be sure the maps were in there when I bought mm -hmm. them. Uh, because uh, that's you know that's what you want if possible. This one I brought. Another thing that people overlook in studying these periods is that Bible encyclopedias. This is Calmet, who is a famous set. It was it was uh, uh, done in edition after edition after edition. Uh, in the collection is a full set of five volumes. Uh, this one is dated eighteen. Uh, Let's see, 23, 1823. This means that everything you find in here, if you look up Caesarea Philippi, it's going to be what people knew in 1823. It's going to be the best of scholarship for the year 1823. So it's very important historically in letting you know what people knew, what they didn't know, what they thought, what they, what they were right about, what they were wrong about, and so on. But the reason I just brought this particular volume in here Another thing that in the 19th century in particular, people had the time or the inclination to do these wonderful steel engravings. Of course, these that the little book, those were steel engravings that were then colored. This book has hundreds, as you can see, hundreds and hundreds of pages, and every page is full of steel engravings. I don't know if you can, this will be upside down to you, but it just goes on. I'll pass that around. Okay, you gotta be careful the front uh, on here is, is going to come off <laughs> at some point. So, uh, but uh, so, of course, you've got to always be careful in opening any 19th century book because I, I just I, I'm, I'm talking longer than I intended to. But I was in the Cam in Cambridge. I was in Cambridge for a while. I was in the Cambridge University Library and I was doing some research and I took a book. It was dated 1530 something, I, and they wouldn't let you do your own uh, xeroxing, of course, for good reasons. Yeah. So I took it down to the Xerox room and I said, will you make me a copy of this? And to my horror, this early 16th century book 
the librarian and took it and went, <laughs> and I heard it crack across the, the top and slapped it down on the Xerox machine. And uh, so I always say, never open a leather bound book, never open it all the way, only open it part of the way and look in there. That way you won't, you won't have that happen to it. But, yeah, so uh, uh, that was a, I thought, what, what is, now what is your job here? What is it you're protecting? Me, uh, that you're protecting that book from me? <laughs> so, but anyway. Uh, yeah, let's look at the whole collection. Is there any one or two that that book really means a lot to you, whether it's the story of the book or the book itself, any one that was one of your just prized discoveries? Oh boy, uh, that's, that's kind of like saying which one of your kids do you like the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, now we know what the collection means to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there have been many. I, I probably ought to say that I found this wonderful, wonderful uh, set of uh, studies on the Holy Land written by John Wilson, mm -hmm. but it was from 1830 and he was a Scotsman, so, uh, but uh, no, I have, I have, uh, it's very hard to just pick out uh, one or two, and there's a story about every one, and for years it was the, the, everybody said when they came to my house, now you're going to really want to see this collection, but please don't ask him to start talking about the books because it's, uh, it, it's not going to stop because I can remember the stories on, on almost all of them. And, uh, uh, and the other thing, I've already said this to somebody, but uh, people who hunt for books like this are in, of the same category as people who fish. You know, you can, uh, you go fishing and you come home and you've been there for eight hours and somebody says, did you catch anything? And you say no. And they say, well, why did you go and fish for eight hours? And, and you know, and, and you say, no, I had a wonderful day, but you didn't catch anything. I know, but it's the fishing. And whenever ever I went anywhere in the world to an old antiquarian bookstore, it was the fishing. And some days you find nothing, and then other days you come upon one. I was telling you about, you all heard the story about if you've been to Jerusalem, you know, they take you to Gordon's Calvary, and they say, now, General Gordon said that this was Calvary, but we don't think so, you know. Well, General Gordon wrote a tiny little book in which he explains why he thinks that's, that's Calvary, and that that's the, the tomb of Jesus. It's a very, very rare book. And uh, it was just, I think, pr kind of privately printed for General Gordon's uh, friends. And I was in uh, Burbank, California, in an old bookstore. And to my total amazement, I pulled a book out. And it was that book that, in which G General Gordon had given the drawing and said, this is shaped like a skull, and this must be the place. And so he, he, from a historical view, he's, totally wrong, but as the history of studying uh, the Holy Land, uh, and as something from the hand of General Gordon, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And I went home that night when they said, did you find anything? I said, boy, did I. <laughs> In Burbank, <laughs> I found this. So they have stories like that. Yeah. yeah. This is great. Thank you, John. A um, couple things to take away from this. One is There'll be a point where this will be a part of the electronic catalog here. I'm not putting any pressure, just whenever. But when you find yourself in a used bookstore somewhere and you come across a, a book like this, you could go to the electronic catalog here. And if we don't have it, you could follow his example and contribute it to the Wilson collection. So that's one thing anybody can do to continue. Cause there's still a few more. He didn't get all of them yet. No. There's still a few more. But that's one thing uh, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, a, a little bit of a story too that's kind of interesting. This collection is going to end up in our Thomas Kincaid room. The one that has the pictures of the Holy Land done by Thomas Kincaid. And it'll be in locked glass case, so protected. And uh, I don't know if it's gonna be white gloves only, but anyway, we're gonna really try to protect this collection. But here's an interesting background. While he was in London, uh, why don't you tell a story? You can tell a story better than I could. Well, uh, we were living in London, and uh, the one of the administrators at Pepperdine is Israel Rodriguez. He's retired now, but uh, 
Israel had a son, Israel Jr. And Israel Jr. happened to be in London on business and he contacted my wife and I and we to have dinner. And uh, he said, you know, my, I said, what brings you to London? He said, well, I, I am a, the, uh, Kincaid's business manager. I'm taking this job with him. And he said, I have a proposal for you. He said, uh, Thomas Kincaid is going to go to Israel f to do a series of paintings. People have been asking him to do that for a long time. Would you be willing to go with him and help him to pick out the sites and talk about them and so on? And I, I said, well, well that's, that's wonderful, very tempting, but unfortunately I, I couldn't work it out. So uh, when the Everett said, well, these are Kincaid paintings around the wall, I said, I was almost involved in, <laughs> in the painting of those. But, uh, so that's as close as I got to it, but it's kind of an interesting coincidence. So, <laughs> so be on the lookout. In fact, I found my copy of Lynch's book, and the one reason his expedition is so famous is he's the one that determined how far below sea level was the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea level, and he was the first one to determine its altitude, if you will. And, and I found it one day. <laughs> Eileen dragged me into the antique mall in Collierville. So while she was looking around, you know, I looked at some of these books and here was Lynch's book. Twice what I wanted to pay for it, the guy wouldn't bargain, so I still paid it. <laughs> and uh, I would have never thought I would have found that in Collierville at the antique mall. So they're, they're out there. So I hope this will raise your uh, awareness or interest in maybe adding uh, to this collection. Uh, a couple of questions or comments before we wrap this up. Anyone would like to ask John? Yes, back. Um, can I say something? Uh, I am from China, that's the Western Earth, and I feel very shocked by you and what you did. Uh, in our society, we are so eager to get the books about how to be successful, and people want to do some critical things in their life. And we barely make, can see uh, people like you. So you just your presence has just uh, shocked me. Yeah, and um, about all how eager for the book and uh, how you think the book is very precious and your collection wheels and uh, just uh, give me a new uh, ways to think uh, about books and things and especially when our Christian book has is very and it's very recently because of persecution we are not allowed to buy some Christian books in Chinese right now it's not allowed so I am trying to uh, collecting some books in my home library because we will be ministry in the future and you just give me that will even more stronger so that's really helpful I, 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 yeah, yeah thank you I, I, I probably should have said this too. The other thing about when you pick up an old book, you pick up a book that was printed in, uh, in 1820, someone has owned that book. A whole series of people have owned that book from 1820 to now for literally hundreds of years. And I sometimes love to just put one of these books down on my desk and think, I wonder who has handled that book. I wonder who has read that book. People who dress differently from us, Who's, uh, uh, who, who spoke an earlier form of, of, of our language, uh, who lived in a different world. Books have a way of just, uh, they, they continue. The generations come and go and books just continue. That's something wonderful about books. In this collection, I just sometimes would look at it and think, these are people who, you know, if you lived in 1830, even if you'd never been to the Middle East and you went and bought this book, what were you thinking about? What what struck you when you read this book all those years ago or multiple centuries ago so a book is a wonderful way to touch the past it's a it's one of the best ways you know to touch thank, the past thank you Amy. Yeah. anyone else like to make comments i just want to say would, would to you brag take that yeah. off a minute so everybody could hear you i okay. think it'd be hard if you can you do you mind doing that so that way they can hear what you say thank you. i just want to brag that i grew up with john <laughs> and my sister Marilyn grew up with his younger brother and uh, about Marilyn my sister one day she and Jim were together with I think some of his cousins and just playing and Marilyn looked at Jim and said 
will you marry me? <laughs> and Jim looked at her and said, no. <laughs> and to this day, he's not married. <laughs> John is one of the uh, renowned scholars in the world of Caesarea Philippi. You need to read a book if Very you have. Very good, yes. But I, I, would you, can you sum up in a couple of sentences what the most important thing you learned about Caesarea Philippi and all those years of excavating in there? Well, yeah, I'll tell you just one other little minor thing that might, might, uh, you might not have heard before. You know, it's uh, in, in the scriptures it says that Jesus went it doesn't say he went to Caesarea Philippi. It says he went to the villages of Caesarea Philippi or to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Go back and look at the references uh, in the Gospels to that. When we started excavating Caesarea Philippi, we began to talk about where are the houses? Where are the residential sections? It was all public buildings. We found Agrippa II's palace, which is wonderful. It's so incredible fine it's not all excavated yet we found ruins of temples we found the Carlo maximus we found all of those public buildings we found no uh, private dwellings and i remember thinking one night after a, after digging a while i thought you know as i think about it the gospel writers don't say that jesus went to caesarea philippi they say he went to the villages of caesarea philippi Sister Philippi, I wonder what, and then it began to dawn on me, and later on in my, doing my research, I got some confirmation of this, that Caesarea Philippi, the city, was a, was a municipal center. That's where the public buildings were, and there was even a marketplace there, and probably even a, a places for sports and, you know, maybe even a library and things like that, but they, it was the public buildings. The people lived in villages outlying. And now as they're doing more and more work in the area, they're finding these little clusters of places where people live. They did not live in the city. So uh, in particular, Mark, I used to go to scholarly meetings and they all talk about the gospel writers don't know the geography of Palestine. You know, they, they can't, the, Mark was never in Palestine. Luke was never in Palestine. They get the geography all, all wrong. I don't know if you all have had to endure this, but I've been to many, many meetings like that. And I thought, isn't it interesting that Mark, not knowing anything about the geography of, of uh, Palestine, knew that Caesarea Philippi was not somewhere you lived. <laughs> it had villages. It's just a tiny, subtle little thing that indicates that the author of Mark knew the area and knew this little, uh, little kind of thing. These are sometimes the sort of little thing you find in, in excavating and it takes it about a generation or two to get into the encyclopedias. In Capernaum, this bathhouse, mm -hmm. the bathhouse was a military bathhouse. The, all these other examples we have of bathhouses from the period are, on, are in army camps. And there was one of those smack in the middle of ancient Capernaum. Well, you, you read the account and it says, the centurion who built the synagogue and, and uh, I had a big argument with Joe Blinkensop one night in our when we were when we were excavating in Capernaum, and he was saying to me, you know, uh, Mark ne Mark's never was never here, and Mark never knew anything about this. And we were talking about that, and uh, later on, I kind of you know gouged him a little bit about that. I said, what about? He said there could not have possibly been a centurion here. Why would a centurion be here? Well, uh, there there was a little army camp next to. Uh, Capernaum, even in Jesus' day. I'm not sure that's even in the archaeological encyclopedias yet that, uh, that uh, Jesus' town where he lived had an army unit uh, next door. And this was their little bathhouse, little square place. So it's those kinds of things. To me, are more important than gold treasure or <laughs> you know, something like that. Though we found one of those too, but that's another yeah. story. <laughs> Yeah, at Capernaum, found a hoard of gold coins. Um, somebody buried them, never did come back to get them. One last question, and then you can ask him some, mill around afterwards. And this could be, a, it's up to you how big you want to answer this, but if you think this collection is impressive, it's nothing compared to his Roman coin collection. <laughs> He's a numismatist. 
So you want to say a word about that collection and just a summary of it because John knows coin more than about her. I mean, he can pick up the coins in his class. I mean, he's, he's got it incredibly organized. There, there's descriptions. There's stories behind those coins, just like you know, stories behind some of these books. That absolutely fascinating because a lot of our history is dependent on those. You know, it, knowing what's happening in many of those contexts on those coins. So it, it's up to you how you want to. But this well, is our I, last I, very question. briefly, I just say what, what I was saying about a book and how the book has this history of all the people who've had it. To, uh, it when you pick up a, a coin that was minted by Pontius Pilate. You just got to think. I wonder who's been, who's handled that. <laughs> Jesus has. I, I wonder what's. Yeah. <laughs> when we were digging at Capernaum, whenever we found first century pottery, there were some monks that, and they would always run over there. They come. That's Jesus pottery. We want it. We want it. And of course, it was it, it was there when Jesus was there. But uh, the, but coins are a wonderful way to get again get back to the ancient world. And coins were always minted for propaganda purposes. So they've got some kind of propaganda on them, and they're telling you they're telling you the same story they were meant to tell the people who used them and spent them as uh, as money. So yeah, it's a parallel interest in all these same years I've been been uh, watching for those same things. I have probably considerably over two thousand coins that are all directly connected with uh, actually with the New Testament or with the lands of the New Testament. Recent years, I've been trying to add also from the uh, Islamic uh, period, which I think we over, sometimes overlook. The the horde, uh, I, the, don't get me started here, but the, the horde of gold coins that we found are, were from the very early days of the Muslim conquest. And uh, we didn't have anybody, it's, they're written in Umayyad, uh, the old Kufic script. So even if you could read Arabic, it was it would be difficult to read, but we fortunately we had a guy down in Jerusalem who who could read it. We had him come up, and uh, uh, and here's what the there were over almost 300 of these coins minted by the Arabs after they had come in to take over essentially the Middle East, and it said on there, God is not begotten. God does not beget. beget, neither is he begotten. Quoting the Quran. Uh-huh. God does not beget, neither is he begotten. You think about anti-Christian propaganda, and Christians had to use money that said that on it. Every one of those coins had that statement. And But what's particularly interesting about that is the coins then had graffiti, where people had scratched, think, taken something sharp and scratched, and uh, there were two things that they, that they would you'd find scratched on numerous of these coins. There was a kind of an X, and there was an M. X Christos, M Maria. In other words, uh, they were trying to cancel out that blasphemous statement by saying Mary and Jesus. <laughs> In other words, you can say that if you want to. But they hung on to the gold. <laughs> but they hung on to the gold. <laughs> so there's a history, there's a kind of a human element in ancient coins that uh, that's sort of like the same kind of thing you get with books. So, yeah. yeah. I'm going to turn this back to Jessica. If you want to sit here, that way you're in the recording here if you want to wrap it up. But, uh, Thank you, John. Yeah, sure. I just want to take a brief moment again just to say thank you. And what struck me through all this is that we got a small glimpse into a few different stories and that each book has its own story. But then you put them all together and it forms this whole new story. And I am just so excited that we get to spend time reading stories. And thank you. I'm just thrilled. Just thrilled.